If you have your Bibles, open up to the Gospel of Luke. It's the third book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And we're going to read from the last chapter, Luke 24. The story that we are in this morning is the walk to Emmaus. It's one of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. This is later that afternoon on that first Easter Sunday when he entered into a conversation and deepened a relationship with these two people. But I'm only reading verses 30 through 32. We'll talk about the whole scripture, so if you have your Bibles, keep them open. If you're looking on an electronic device, keep it open. Luke 24, 13 through 35, but I'm only reading verses 30 through 32, this is really the climax of the story. When he, Jesus, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? This is God's word. It's for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we recognize your presence in this very room, in our lives, in this church, and we ask you to do a work that can only be attributed to you. Lord, bring this text to life. Show us your activity and move us further in our faith that we might join you in your work, your activity here in the world. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Say that with me. Come Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This morning, like I said earlier, we continue in a church-wide sermon series on hospitality, and it is connected to our strategic plan and very much expresses the desire that we have for Marvin Church to be a more welcoming and more hospitable community to people that God sends our way. Last week, we began this series with a theology of hospitality. We were in Ephesians 4, Pastor Doug in here, John Wayne down the hall, but they preached the same text which said, we are in Christ, and we are being built into the gospel truth as it is experienced by others out in the world. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And so that's the theology behind hospitality. We are the ones in whom and through whom God is working as we are in Christ. God has been so good to us. He has been so hospitable to us. This morning our focus is on hospitality within the family. And we're really talking about the family of God the body of Christ. I think the things that we have sung and especially the testimony that we experienced go hand in hand so well with the theme for this morning, the family of God. We're talking about hospitality within the family and that's why, that's why we're here focusing on this text. That's why we heard from Jarrett Davis. You may not remember much more from this service, but you'll remember his story, and if anything, how his little girl was impacted by the teacher remembering her name outside of after vacation Bible school. That is better than Disney World. Let me just say right out of the gate, and that experience confirmed it, that it is on you and me, it is on us to see people, to notice them, to make sure that they are greeted. I've heard from more than one person, even just this past week, how easy it is for people to walk onto our campus on Sunday morning, sit down in one of our worship spaces, and then leave without being greeted by anyone. Lord, I hope that's never the experience that's realized here. And we have something to do with that when we see someone and speak to them and let them know we're glad they're here. Last fall, I think it was Jeff Campbell's first 
week as our director of student ministry. Wednesday night, let me back up, there was another person whose first visit to worship with us heard about midweek. They were invited to come back for midweek to receive a meal, try out a class, even though it was November. Jeff is walking down this hallway and that person is at the door on Irwin Street because you know when you Google Marvin Church it sends you to Irwin Street. And so they showed up there and the doors are locked. But Jeff opened the door, brought them in, asked them who they were here to meet and took them into Pertle Hall so that they could meet the person they were going to meet who'd invited them to dinner and I think it was maybe brisket that night. And so Jeff saw them saw the need and responded to it. And it's on each and every one of us. People come our way all the time. God sends them to us on Sunday morning, on Wednesday evening, even throughout the week. People who are alone. Maybe they are lonely. People who are looking for something, no doubt, looking for someone, they may not even realize it. His name is Jesus. He is the one true God. And how we, as the family of God, relate to these people God sends our way, it has everything to do with their experience and maybe even whether or not they'll come back to be with us. I'm not just talking about relating to the people that you like not talking about relating to people that look like you, but I'm talking about, Lord, give us eyes to see that we might respond to people that are here who may be hurting or may be alive but are looking for community. It's every one of our job to be the host, all of us to be the host. One of my favorite lines in the scripture that we just read is, were not our hearts burning within us as we walked along the way and talked about the scripture with this someone? He opened to us the scriptures. In that whole story, there are two disciples walking along the road going from Jerusalem to Emmaus. That's a distance of seven miles. It's like walking from Marvin maybe almost to the tollway uh, 49 south of town. They're walking there seven miles. And in this story, we see these two people go from exploring Christ, if you will, to a life that is Christ-centered. They go from a life of oblivion, clueless about the events of recent days, to hearts that are set on fire because of the work and person of Jesus as they've encountered him. This scripture is a snapshot of the human condition of where we are to where we can be. And we see that tension and that movement in this passage. It starts in verse 13. It was mid-afternoon on that first Easter Sunday. Two of Jesus' followers, they're walking the road, and as they walk, they're bouncing these things off of each other. And in my mind, they are sad a little confused, maybe even a little bit angry. Sad because their friend, Jesus, had died. And Jesus didn't just go gently into the night. It wasn't pretty. He died a criminal's death. He was beaten to a bloody mess, nailed up on that cross. And all the while, Israel's hopes were pinned on him as being Messiah, the one who would lead them out of Roman oppression. But when the time was right and Rome had him in their grip, Jesus did nothing. The one to whom was ascribed all the accolades of a king just a few days earlier was now dead. They must have been sad. I bet they were confused as well because this man had the proof to back up his claims. Throughout the scripture, he claimed to be the son of God. He even equated himself as being one with God. And then he proceeded to walk on water, to feed the masses to heal the sick, to overcome the physical and natural laws of this created world. Jesus even raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus understood the scriptures, taught them as one who had real authority. It was reasonable to think this is one whom all the prophets and all the law point to. 
But in terms of leading his followers to a victory and establishing a new world order, Jesus failed, if you will. You know these two were sad. They had to be confused, and I'm sure they were angry because they bought into this man, Jesus, who commanded an audience with very much compassion. He knew how to work a crowd. Jesus really had a following, and yet he was not full of himself. It didn't go to his head. He was so real, so genuine. But when reality set in, he did nothing. He was like a lamb led to slaughter. There was no uprising, no rebellion. Jesus surrendered and gave into the Roman government, played right into the high priest's hand, and to make matters worse, three days later, and nothing else has changed as far as these two know. Sad, confused, angry, and they're walking along the road to Emmaus, full of all of these emotions, discussing all of these things, and all of a sudden, there's somebody else who is walking with them, who started asking questions. And his naivety was unbelievable. One of the two named Cleopas asked this person, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened in these recent days? Talk about irony, because Jesus is the only one who really knew what was going on, what was at stake, what was at hand. So on the road to Emmaus, there is emotion being felt, confusion about present circumstance because of inappropriate assumptions on the part of the two, and that will get you every time. Even in today's world, even in the church, Francis Chan is an author, teacher, preacher who told a story once about a gang member who gave his life to Christ. And this guy was heavily involved, deeply engaged in gang activity. And when you are in a gang, it's blood in and it's blood out. That guy walked away from his gang and it cost him something. And he began attending church as a faithful believer, but soon walked away from church and re-entered into his gang, blood in. And Francis Chan observed that he was no longer around. He caught up with this guy and asked how a man who'd been given a new life can go back to the old. And this guy said very simply that He'd misunderstood what being a Christian was all about. He thought it'd be like his gang with a family there to support him, to have his back, to encourage him, lend a hand, take care of. But he found that it was mostly just Sundays and Wednesdays, a meeting at a building, not life inspiring or impacting much at all. And you know that church probably had a welcome and hospitality ministry. That church was in trouble. I don't know about you. I want so much more than Sunday and Wednesday. I want so much more than membership, worship attendance, people coming back to church, and please, don't mishear me, because those things are important, but if they're central, if that's all, we're missing out, and maybe even missing the point. I want Jesus Christ crucified, dead, raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and because he did, he went from right here on the outside to right here into the hearts of those who claim his name. I want that for me. I want that for you. And if we are serious about him, if we are pursuing him, all that other stuff will fall into place. Lately, this year even, I felt like with respect to my prayer life, God has said, test me in that. Pray and see what happens. And one of the ways I've been praying is, Lord, renew our minds. Give us hearts of flesh. 
Give us eyes to see and ears to hear the need that is around us so that we might go and be and do with you. And here's the deal. If I want that, if we want that for Marvin Church, you know God wants that so much more than we do. I wonder how he is praying and how that is shaping the culture and the community here at Marvin Church. Lord, give us more. Save us from the troubles that plague our church, not just political divisiveness that creeps its way in or COVID ridiculousness that creeps its way in or denominational strife. More than that, save us from just being Monday and Wednesday Christians who have neat little devotionals, live our lives out there on fake book and don't see the world around us. Well, there is hope. And even though Jesus played hard to get and his followers' eyes were kept from seeing him, it's grace that Jesus even appeared to them in the first place. And in verse 25, there is a shift in this story where Jesus starts asking questions. And you know, as we ask questions, it often opens up the door for possibility of what might be. And in verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus began to explain the scriptures concerning himself, concerning the Messiah. Jesus had a handle on current events, and he gave them, those two disciples, a perspective they'd never even considered. And when they arrived home, Jesus acted like he was going to continue on his way, but they insisted that he stay with them. If anything, stay for dinner. And Jesus obliged. And as the meal was prepared, no doubt by the homeowners, in their home, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks over it and Jesus broke it and he gave it to them as if it was his bread, as if it was his home. It's the same thing he did 72 hours prior. And that's when it clicked for these two. This is Jesus. The Lord had been with us the whole way. And with that revelation came the realization, did not our hearts burn within us? Jesus is the chief cornerstone, building his church, not with brick and mortar, but flesh and blood. It's no wonder their hearts caught fire. Not long after that revelation, immediately even, Jesus disappeared right before their very eyes, and these two followers got back on the road and ran seven miles to Jerusalem. They don't know where Jesus went, but sure knew that he was alive, and they shared that experience, that testimony, that reality with their friends. Miroslav Volf wrote, Inscribed on the heart of God's grace is the rule that we can be its recipients only if we do not resist becoming its agents. Let me say that again. Inscribed on the heart of God's grace is this rule that we can be its recipients only if we do not resist becoming its agents. What has happened to us must be done by us. I want to share how I've seen that played out here in Tyler, Texas, just this past week. I met a single mother of one whose child is in kindergarten, and she told me about his birth, about bringing him home from the hospital, about doing all the things that mothers do, let alone single mothers, those things that can just wear you out. And one day a girlfriend stopped by, really this was just an acquaintance, and she offered to hold that baby while this single mom did some things that she needed to get done. Well, she could hardly rest her eyes, and so she slept for three hours. That's what she needed most. 
And when she woke up, she's almost beside herself because this acquaintance was in her home with her baby while she was out cold asleep. And she said something like the single mom, I have trust issues. Don't mean, don't think this means we're going to be friends. That was five years ago. And over the course of time, by showing up repeatedly, by being hospitable, breaking bread together, they are best friends. And this person is now doing the same thing for others. That's because what's been, what's happened to us must be done by us. Church, you know that every person flourishes when hospitality is experienced, whether you're on the giving end of it or the receiving end of it. One of my professors from seminary, Christine Pohl, said that hospitality ought to be generous and uncalculating rather than ambitious. And what does it say that we've got to write it down and make a strategy about it? Our hospitality ought to be generous and uncalculating rather than ambitious. It is a way of life. It defines who we are as a people of God, who we are as a church. And so as we draw this time of worship to a close, may God give us the mind of Christ. May he circumcise our hearts. May God give us eyes to see and ears to hear the need around us because there are people among us who are alone, who are lonely, who are looking for something more, and his name is Jesus. May we be a people that offers hospitality because we've received it. May we be responsive to the hospitality that God has shown us because what happens to us must be done by us in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because our faith is of action, I want to give us an opportunity to respond verbally by stating what we believe. I invite you to stand with me as we proclaim the Apostles' Creed in such a way that people down the hall or people watching on stream, live stream can hear us say it because what we believe is not what we say, it's what we do. But let's proclaim it together by saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.